Welcome everyone to the Spectral Geometry in the Cloud Seminar. Uh, this week we have the pleasure of having Benjamin Bogosel, who is from the Centre de Mathématiques Appliquées de l'École Polytechnique. And Benjamin will speak about uh, uh, on the polygonal Fabricran inequality. The virtual floor is yours, Benjamin. I want to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. As the title says, I will talk about uh, the polygonal fabric fabric inequality and uh, of some recent results that we obtained together with uh, Dorin Bukur to this problem. So first I will start by, by an introduction. Problems are problems where we optimize a certain uh, functional that depends on a shape which can belong to, to a certain class. The, there are various uh, types of uh, optimization problems that, uh, that are known. And in particular, uh, there are numerical tools that are often used in uh, shape optimization. And uh, in engineering, for example, uh, numerical tools are used to improve a given shape, to improve a given design. Then we can uh, use numerical tools in order to enlarge the idea, the class of ideas that we can have for theoretical studies. Uh, optimization algorithms can give us, uh, and results given by optimization algorithms can give us uh, results for uh, which can indicate new theoretical paths. But then we can also try to prove something uh, in shape optimization uh, uh, using numerics. And the first uh, case is uh, trying to prove that the shape is not optimal for a given uh, problem or to contradict a, con a conjecture. Uh, and this can be far, can be achieved by finding a counterexample. Uh, for example, you have a, a shape optimization algorithm. You let the optimization algorithm run. You get uh, optimal shape found numerically. And if this optimal shape has uh, an objective function, an objective value that is smaller than uh, the conjecture one, then we are done. We we found a better shape. But then, if we want to prove that the given shape is optimal using numerics. This becomes hard, and uh, in order to underline the possible difficulties, I first present uh, how a proof strategy can, uh, for proving that a certain point is a minimizer, can be described for a function depending on a finite number of parameters. So if you have a function defined on Rn with real values, you conjecture that you have a, a certain minimizer, x star, then you can imagine the following strategy. First, you would like to prove that X star is a local minimizer. So in this case, you have a whole uh, neighborhood of X star where you cannot find any better candidates. Uh, and you would like to have an explicit uh, um, size of this neighborhood where local minimality occurs. Then you would like to prove that uh, points far away from X star cannot be minimizers. And uh, maybe you can achieve this by, by some theoretical results, by some qualitative results. And uh, in order to try to reduce the problem to a, a finite number of computations, you would like that together with a point. So let's say that you are able to prove that for a certain value x, uh, the function f of x is smaller than the optimal value uh, for the conjecture minimizer. Then you would like to be able to extend this to a whole neighborhood of x. And uh, Using this uh, strategy, you can imagine that using a finite number of uh, numerical computations, you can conclude that X star is indeed the minimizer of your function on Rn. Of course, uh, to obtain a proof, uh, all the numerical computations need to have uh, certified error bounds. And uh, you need to take into account, for example, mach machine errors and uh, there are tools which allow you to do this, and uh, I mentioned uh, interval arithmetics, which uh, is a, is a well-known tool, tool for, for validating numerical computations. Um, there are uh, examples in uh, shape optimization and spectral theories, uh, recent uh, results where numerical tools were used um, successfully in proving theoretical results. And, uh, in this work, we try to show how such tools could be used to, to prove uh, the faber uh, the polygonal faber faber inequality. And uh, for this, let me introduce uh, briefly, because I, I don't think uh, uh, in this audience we need to go into much details regarding these aspects. Uh, but 
Uh, the eigenvalues of the Dirichlet Laplace operator are defined in the classical way. You have the Laplace n equals to lambda u. You have the Dirichlet boundary condition. We know that uh, there is a sequence of I, uh, positive eigenvalues which verify uh, uh, the characterization by Rayleigh co quotients. And uh, the eigenvalues behave well with respect to scaling. We have an explicit dependence. Uh, then we know that uh, we have a, a monoton monotonicity property. The eigenvalues are decreasing with respect to set inclusions. And uh, also, if uh, we, we are on a connected set, then the first eigenvalue is simple. Uh, having defined, defined the eigenvalues of the Dirichlet Laplace operator, um, the question of optimizing these eigenvalues is a classical one, and it goes back to Lord Rayleigh. And uh, the problem can be stated as follows. If you want a shape that minimizes the area of a membrane at a given frequency, then uh, if you minimize the first, uh, if you fix uh, the first uh, main frequency, then the disk is uh, the optimal solution. And we can reformulate this as uh, uh, the fact that the disk minimizes the first eigenvalue at fixed area. And this was proved by Faber and Kran in the 1920s. Now, the classical proof of this type of uh, results uh, goes through symmetrization techniques. And, uh, well, the symmetrization techniques uh, work as follows. You take a domain and you replace it with a symmetric one, either directly with a ball, if you talk about the Schwarz symmetrization, or with a domain symmetric with respect to, to a line when you talk about Steiner symmetrization. Then you have a procedure of symmetrizing functions from uh, your domain omega to the symmetrized domain. Uh, well, for the type of symmetries presented, symmetrization techniques presented here, the L2 norm is preserved and the L2 norm of the gradient is decreased. Therefore, symmetrization methods decrease the first eigenvalue. And you can imagine how you can use uh, this type of techniques to prove haber kranz inequality. As is the case for the classical isoperimetric problem, uh, you know that if you fix the area and you minimize the perimeter, then the disk is, uh, or the ball minimizes the perimeter as, at fixed area. And this also holds in the class of polygons. If you minimize the perimeter of a polygon at fixed area, then the optimal one will be the regular polygon. And therefore it is natural to assume that the same would happen for the first eigenvalue. And it was conjectured by Paul and Sego that if you minimize the first eigenvalue for area constraint in dimension two among uh, n gons, uh, polygons with n sides, then uh, the unique solution to this problem would be the regular polygon with n sides. And, uh, well, one can prove that uh, solutions to this problem exist and uh, they consist of uh, polygons that have exactly n sides. If you consider uh, Pn to be, if you consider the minimization in uh, the class of polygon with at most n sides, then you can prove that uh, the minimizer has exactly n side, and a proof can be found in, in the book by Antoine Enro on uh, the spe spectral uh, problems. And following the nice properties of the Dirichlet class eigenvalues, like the scaling with respect to homotities. You can reformulate the problem in various different equ equivalent ways up to rescaling, and in particular, uh, minimizing the product between the area and the first eigenvalue gives us an equivalent problem that does not have any constraints, and we will, we will use this formulation in the following. What is known regarding the uh, faber kran inequality for polygons. Well, uh, Paul and Sego proved that for uh, triangles and quadrilaterals, the regular polygons are minimizers, and the proofs use Steiner symmetrizations. For uh, triangles, you can prove that a sequence of Steiner symmetrization will converge to the equilateral triangle, while for quadrilaterals, things are even simpler since you can perform just a few symmetrizations like shown in, in the picture. 
and you can arrive at a rectangle and for rectangles you know the spectrum so you can uh, you can show that the squares are optimal however for uh, uh, n larger larger than five almost nothing is known up to this date and the the problem is that Steiner symmetrization does not work since you can increase the number of sites when performing such a procedure. Now, there are various works on the subject. I will cite uh, related numerical to numerical simulations. Antunes and Freitas uh, computed the first eigenvalue for many polygons, and uh, they concluded that they, they did not found anything better than uh, the regular polygon. Uh, myself, in my PhD thesis, I implemented a gradient-based algorithm based on the shape derivative, which obtained the regular, the regular polygons for uh, small n. There's also a paper by Dominguez, uh, Nigam, and uh, Shahyari, uh, who used stoch stochastic optimization for optimizing uh, Steklov and uh, Dirichlet eigenvalues on polygons, and they also confirm the conjecture for uh, pentagons. And then on the theoretical sides, there is a, a paper by Pragalain Velichkov where uh, they show that um, uh, triangles, the only triangles that verify the optimality conditions are the equilateral ones. But unfortunately, the proof, the proof does not work for higher n. And then the paper that generated uh, uh, was a starting point for our work was the paper, a paper by Laurent in 2019 where uh, he computed the second shape derivative for the Dirichlet energy on polygons and uh, deduced an explicit formula for uh, the associated Hessian matrix. And uh, this motivated us to, to do the same thing in the case of the eigenvalue, to try to see uh, how can we exploit this to, to devise a, a proof strategy. Uh, after uh, submitting our preprint, uh, uh, a month ago, we received a mail by Emmanuel Indre, who said that he also worked on on this problem, but for now there is a, there is a no no preprint, uh, and uh, following a, an abstract of one of his talks, uh, he I guess he uses techniques similar to what he used for the quantitative isoperimetric inequalities for polygons, and tries to apply it. Uh, those techniques to, to this context. Now, what is our proof strategy? Of course, we, are, we work with polygons, so we have a finite dimensional optimization problem, and the, the optimization variables are the coordinates of the polygon. So the first step will be the computation of the Hessian matrix with respect to, of the eigenvalue with respect to these variables. This type of uh, computation was not available before, and but we will talk about this in a moment. Then after the Hessian matrix is computed, uh, try to give a numerical proof of the positive definiteness of the Hessian matrix and try to obtain the local minimality of the regular polygon. And we almost do this for uh, n uh, going from five to six, seven, and eight. Uh, we also need uh, some uh, theoretical results. Uh, we would like to have a quantification of the neighborhood around the regular polygon where the local minimality occurs. And this uh, is done via a theoretical stability result for the eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix. Then in order to exclude polygons that are almost flat, we have an analytic estimate of the maximal diameter. Uh, we show that we can reduce the conjecture for a given n to a finite number of certified numerical computations. And I will go uh, through some of these points uh, in the following. Let's talk about the Hessian matrix and its eigenvalues. Uh, the objective function, um, uh, which we'll uh, take in the following, is the product between uh, the area and the eigenvalue. And in order to understand the sensibility of uh, this objective function with respect to the variables, which are the coordinates, we must know how the eigenvalue changes when, you, when we perturb uh, the boundary of the polygons. Now, when dealing with shapes and functionals that depend on shape, there is a notion of derivative uh, called shape derivative, which uh, is often useful in practice for uh, 
deducing optimality conditions and also for uh, uh, performing numeric numerical simulations. And given a shape and uh, a vector field theta, we can consider uh, the uh, shape uh, perturbed by, uh, by uh, the vector field theta, like identity plus theta applied to omega. And in some cases, we can express uh, the objective function on this perturbation in the same way as we do a Taylor expansion, the objective function on uh, the non-perturbed domain on omega plus a linear term, which is the shape derivative uh, and ha eventually higher order terms. And un under some uh, regularity assumptions, uh, the shape derivative, the linear uh, term appearing in the expansion above can often be written as uh, a boundary integ integral of some function f times the uh, normal component of the perturbation vector on the boundary. Now, for the case of uh, the Dirichlet class eigenvalues, of course, uh, shape uh, derivatives of the eigenvalues are known uh, in the literature. Um, you can show that the, a simple eigenvalue is differentiable without regularity assumptions for the shape omega, as uh, can be seen in the book by uh, Antoine Aro and Michel Pierre. And for a simple eigenvalue, there is a formula with classical formula, which is known minus the integral on the boundary, the square of the normal derivative times the normal perturbation vector. Uh, now one can hold, one can show that uh, this formula holds uh, if the eigenfunction is in H2, since we need to have a trace of uh, the gradient on the boundary. The formula also holds when uh, the domain is convex. And uh, also by, by looking at uh, the event eventual singularities uh, near the corners, you can show that the same formula holds also for polygons. However, if you want to compute the second uh, derivative of the eigenvalue, formulas are available uh, given as integrals of, on the boundary, but they require additional regularities, uh, regularity assumptions for omega, which are not available uh, for polygons. And then uh, the idea that uh, uh, motivated uh, uh, the, the following uh, computations uh, can be found in the paper by Laurent, uh, who uh, proposes to uh, write the shape derivative as a, a volumic integral, the integral on omega of some uh, some uh, matrix multiplied by the Jacobian of the vector field plus some vectors uh, multiplied with the vector field. And of course, uh, these type of formulas uh, are uh, well known. It's, uh, it's not something that uh, Laurent invented, but uh, usually people went for uh, finding uh, the standard form, which is uh, a function multiplied with theta dot n, while in our case, it is more uh, efficient or it is better to leave uh, the integral on uh, the whole domain, since in this case, we don't have as many regularity assumptions uh, on omega for the shape derivative to be written. Now, let me show how the computation would go for the for the uh, Dirichlet eigenvalues of the Dirichlet Laplace operator. Um, now I, I will not go into details since uh, this is uh, classical and I will show you the computation, how one will do the computation for the derivative of the first eigenvalue. And then the same thing will be done for computing the second derivative. So if you have a vector field, you consider the perturbed domain. And then we consider uh, defined on the perturbed domain, which then we transport back to a fixed domain, the fixed domain omega. Uh, then you can imagine uh, you have uh, formulas for transporting functions, which are just uh, changes of variables, and also formulas for moving uh, uh, variational formulations from uh, omega theta to omega. And uh, well, this, uh, these are, are classical and well known. If you consider the variational formulation for, the, for an eigenvalue of the Dirichlet Laplace equation, you just move this back to omega by using the formulas described previously. 
uh, there is uh, the function uh, u theta here, which is the the function, an eigenfunction for uh, lambda that is transported back to omega. And this function is Fréchet differentiable at uh, zero. And uh, this derivative exists without uh, smoothness requirements on omega. And uh, the Fréchet derivative is called the material derivative. And in the following is denoted by u dot. You just take this relation and you take uh, the derivative uh, with respect to theta at theta equals to zero. And this will give you the variation formulation for the material derivative. And of course, here you, you can see that for this material derivative, you have a bilinear form that uh, has a non-zero kernel, since any eigenfunction, uh, if you take V here equal to an eigenfunction corresponding to lambda, then uh, this uh, bilinear form vanishes. And in order to get uniqueness, you need to add the normalization condition, like, for example, the derivative of the normalization condition that you have for the, for the eigenvalue. This gives you a supplementary equation to get uniqueness. Okay. Now, uh, if you have the equation for the material derivative, uh, as I said, if you replace v by an eigenfunction associated to lambda, you get you get zero on this uh, left side, so you eliminate all the material derivatives. But what you you get from the right hand side is exactly a formula for the shape derivative. So you recover the shape derivative of a simple eigenvalue in a in a volumic form but then we don't go we don't integrate this by parts to to get a, a surface formula but we just per perturb uh, now omega with respect to a different vector field so then we, we write the shape derivative on the perturbed domain again uh, the shape derivative at omega xi with respect to theta then as before in order to differentiate with respect to xi, we want to be to have integrals on a fixed domain. So we transport everything back to omega. Then we get an integral, and under the integral sign, everything is differentiable with respect to psi. So we can compute the derivative. And this gives us the second uh, shape derivative of uh, a simple eigenvalue in uh, as a, an integral on omega of uh, some function depending on theta and psi. And in this uh, in this integrand function, you, you can see there is a part that depends on the material derivatives, uh, which are depend on theta and psi. And uh, there is uh, another part which is explicit in terms of the first of, of an associated eigenfunction and the perturbation uh, field. Up to our knowledge, this formula is new. And uh, what is particular about it is, is that it does not require smoothness assumptions on omega. So it is possible to apply this to polygons. And this is what we will do in the following. So uh, we have a formula for the second shape derivatives for a general shape and general perturbations. Now, if we restrict ourselves to polygons, uh, then we need to construct a class of polygonal perturbation. And here again, we inspire ourselves from the paper of Laurent. We have a polygon, we take a, a vector which perturbs each uh, vertex and uh, this vector will be theta i. Then we defined a, a piecewise linear function on some triangulation of the polygon, which can be either without interior points, like the one shown in the left here, or with uh, one interior point, uh, like uh, on the right-hand side. And this will be useful uh, later on for the regular polygon. And using this uh, family of piecewise, uh, affine uh, functions, we construct a global Lipschitz perturbation uh, which preserves polygons. So in the following, we will just take omega to be a polygon, and we will take theta and psi to be of the form presented here for a particular triangulation that we can choose. And uh, using this, we can compute first the gradient with respect to vertex perturbations. So as I said, we take the shape derivative formula, we replace theta with, with the perturbation corresponding to the polygons that we described previously. And we show that the gradient of the eigenvalue with respect to uh, the coordinates is just a, uh, a union of integrals of vectors. So we get a vector in uh, the same space uh, 
as the space of coordinates. And using this formula, you can show, for example, that the regular polygon is critical for the first eigenvalue multiplied with the area is the first uh, uh, thing that uh, a minimizer should verify. And also you can imagine that you can use this type of formulas in numerical simulations. Now, concerning the Hessian matrix. Uh, I'm just, is... Sorry, Benjamin, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, so um, from this formula, is it possible to, to identify some other critical points than the regular polygon, or is it the only one that... Uh... We did not found, find any other critical points than the regular polygon, if that's the question. So, and, but we, can, we, could not, we could not exclude other critical points either. So it would be nice if uh, using uh, this formula, you could show that the regular polygon is the only critical point, but we do not have such a result. Now, concerning the Hessian matrix, we do basically the same thing, but with the formula concerning, uh, concerning the second shape derivative. And uh, remember that we had those quantities uh, concerning material derivatives, u dot of theta. And now since theta depends on, uh, on the perturbations of the vertices, we can uh, decompose these material derivatives uh, with respect to the, to the parameters theta i. And we get a set of uh, equations corresponding to the, the material derivatives on polygons. This comes directly from, uh, from replacing uh, theta uh, in, the, in the corresponding variational formulation. And for uniqueness to consider also the uh, normalization condition. However, the difficulty which will uh, arise from theoretical and both numerical points of view is that the right-hand side for this equation is not in L2. So you see you have derivatives on the test function. So the resulting functions will not be H2 regular. And this will pose problems later on. Okay, so as I said, you plug everything back into the, into the formula of the second shape derivative and you get that the Hessian matrix has the following block structure. You have uh, uh, an n times n block matrix made, made, made of uh, blocks of size two, which are constructed using either uh, the um, material uh, derivatives uh, written uh, on the previous slide and uh, the gradients of the functions phi j and uh, the eigenvalue, eigenfunction u associated to lambda. So this formula is, uh, well, it's a bit complicated, but it's, it comes directly from uh, what we saw before. Uh, concerning uh, the stability result, we have a general theorem uh, that says that if you have uh, the regular polygon and we denote with star quantities that are associated with uh, the regular polygon, and if you have the regular polygon and uh, another polygon close to it, then you can show between uh, the Hessian uh, matrix uh, on the perturbed polygon and the Hessian matrix on the regular one is controlled by a constant times the size of the perturbation to a certain power. And uh, as a consequence, the eigenvalues verify the same type of S. In order to prove this theorem, which I will not uh, detail here, you need to have uh, control of all the terms appearing in the Hessian matrix, like the eigenvalue, the eigenfunction, and uh, what, what is uh, the complicated term, the material derivatives which appear. And uh, this is done by ex exploiting the fact that the eigenfunction on the regular polygon, the first eigenfunction uh, is, uh, or a general eigenfunction is in H2 plus S or, or some, so it's a bit more regular than H2. And this allows us to obtain uniform estimates uh, using uh, Stein extensions. Coming to the regular polygon, we would like to have a proof of local minimality. Um, in order to uh, do this, we consider the Hessian matrix of lambda times the area. And first we observe that four of the eigenvalues are zero. And basically this, Four eigenvalues corresponds, correspond to, to motions of the polygon which leave the objective function invariant. And since this is a scale invariant functional, you have translations which give you two, two zero eigenvalues 
rotations, which give you another zero eigenvalue, and the homotities, which gives you give you another zero eigenvalues. Therefore, uh, if you fix two vertices, this corresponds to uh, having a two uh, a sub matrix of size two n minus four, and this sub matrix is positive definite if you are able to prove that the other two n minus four eigenvalues are strictly positive. So our objective will be in the following to prove in some way that, uh, well, at the regular polygon, you have zero, uh, four zero eigenvalues and two n minus four eigenvalues that are strictly positive. On the regular polygon, if you use a symmetric uh, triangulation like the one uh, described uh, in, uh, in the drawing on, on this slide with uh, a, an additional point in the center, you can show that the Hessian matrix becomes much simpler. Many of the terms, uh, complicated terms that appear before simplify, and you obtain uh, basically only three terms. Of course, the one, con the complicated one still rem remains with the material derivatives. Then you have one other term, which is related to the Hessian of the area. This term uh, has both uh, positive and negative eigenvalues. Uh, you can show that the term related to the material derivatives only has negative eigenvalues. And there is also a third term related to the eigenfunction, which has positive eigenvalues. So uh, you cannot deduce that the matrix is uh, symmetric uh, or a positive definite only by looking at the structure, since you have uh, all three types of, of uh, configurations here. Uh, now, if you want to look at the eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix, it turns out that uh, looking at uh, the coordinates in the usual Euclidean basis is not the, be not the be best thing that we can do. Uh, the best would be to change the basis around each two uh, radial and tangential coordinates. When doing this, you can, you can see that uh, the matrix, the Hessian matrix, will not change if you perform a circular. Uh, uh, perturbation of uh, circular permutation of the vertices of the polygon. So in fact, you will get that the Hessian is uh, block circulant. And for block circulant matrices, you have a nice description of the spectrum in terms of uh, the blocks that are situated on the first line and uh, the roots of unity of order n. And uh, you, you have explicit eigenvalues for uh, for uh, a block circulant matrix in terms of the eigenvalues of some, some uh, well-defined uh, two-dimensional matrices. And we do this, uh, we do these computations in, in our case. And in the following, if you see A uh, applied to two functions, so a bilinear form, this is just uh, the bilinear form associated to the material derivative like the square scalar product, the integral of the scalar product of the gradients minus lambda, uh, the usual L2 scalar product. After lengthy computations, you can, you can find explicitly the eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix uh, for, uh, for our objective function on the regular polygon. So I will not insist much on this formula since uh, there is not, not much to be said. Uh, they are uh, quite complicated, but there is a, a structure that that can be seen, and uh, but we are we are not able to prove that the eigenvalues are positive for now. So we, we do not have a theoretical proof of the the local minimality. Uh, however, we can we can show that four of the eigenvalues are zero analytically. You can show uh, various facts like it is possible to or to express the eigenvalues only in terms of uh, the material derivatives. Or furthermore, you can show that they depend only on the, the first eigenfunction and the, the derivatives associated to one vertex. Of course, uh, we cannot, uh, for, for the moment, we do not have a theoretical proof, but we can try to approximate these eigenvalues numerically and uh, have a numerical proof of the local minimality property. Here below, I show you a symmetric mesh that could be used in order to to compute these eigenvalues, and I show you two plots of the, the two material derivatives associated to the first uh, vertex. And you can see, uh, in particular, that uh, 
the resulting uh, solutions are not in H2 since, since we have discontinuities in the derivative along certain segments inside uh, the polygon. Now, concerning the numerical approximation, uh, we have analytical formulas for the eigenvalues. We would like to show that these eigenvalues are positive, uh, at least for polygons with small number of sides. Um, in order to do this, we would like to approximate these eigenvalues and have explicit error estimates to be able to guarantee the, the precision of our, our results. Now, uh, what are the main idea when dealing with uh, uh, validated computing when uh, approximating, solu approximating solutions of PDEs? We, we choose to work with the finite elements method and I will justify uh, this in, uh, in a moment. And there are multiple sources of error there is uh, the question of the difference between the solution of the analytical of the continuous problem and the solution of the di discrete problem, which is uh, uh, investigated whenever one uses finite element method as a discretization method. And there are various results of the type, uh, the dis difference between U and UH is uh, smaller than some constant and some power of H depending on the norm that you use. There are other sources of error, which one does not really take into account. If you solve a finite element problem, you have a linear system solved behind it. And the solutions of these systems are obtained using iterative algorithms. So there, these systems are not solved explicitly. And there is also the question of working with floating point arithmetic. And uh, when uh, meshing your domain and when assembling uh, the matrices involved in the finite element method, you also have possible errors that might arise. There are other well-known uh, methods like the method of particular solutions, which can be uh, quite precise for computing the eigenfunctions. But these type of methods, up to our knowledge, are not uh, available for general right-hand sides, like the ones we are interested in, or for more general operators. For the Laplacian eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, there are explicit a priori error estimates, like uh, the ones in uh, Liu and Oishi, uh, where they, they show by giving explicit constant depending on the size of the mesh uh, and on the triangles involving the mesh, so the eigenvalues uh, the eigenfunctions in L2 and the, uh, the gradients all have uh, explicit error bounds and uh, you, can, you can compute all the constants involved. Therefore, if you want to obtain a certain precision for any one of these quantities, it is enough to choose a good H and uh, do the required computation if the computation is feasible. Of course, there are other classes of error estimates like a posteriori error estimates which generally give better error bounds, but are more technical, so we do not go on this path. And uh, just to, to underline why, why things are, are difficult is uh, when you want a high precision in your results, you need to have a small H, so a small me mesh size, but this small mesh size leads to large discrete linear systems for which you, can, uh, you cannot easily control the machine errors that appear in the computation. So you see there is a competition between having a high enough precision, but not having a too large problem to solve in order to validate our uh, results. Now, on, on this uh, numerical part, our contribution was for problems of the following form. So remember the bilinear form will be associated to the material uh, derivative. Uh, and we needed the right-hand sides, which can have uh, terms in L2, which are good, but also terms which are supported on segments that lie inside the domain. And we showed that if we have such terms, with the same regularity as those given in our cases, uh, which come from traces of uh, gradients of uh, the eigenfunctions, and, uh, uh, we can show that we have explicit error estimates uh, with a power that is not too nice. It's h to the power 0 0.5 minus gamma for every gamma between 0 and 1 half. And of course, the problem is that the constants become large when gamma goes to 0. So these were the, the type of results that we, we used in the, in the um, uh, results that I will show in the next slide. 
However, uh, we have some ongoing ideas uh, which show that this type of estimates could probably be improved. Uh, you don't, the, the solution of such a problem is not in H2, but it's, piece, it's piecewise H2 uh, by looking more carefully at, uh, at uh, uh, results regarding uh, uh, regularity like those in uh, the book of Griswold. And therefore you can improve the estimate, notably the power here could be uh, improved to H. So we hope that uh, some, uh, some new results that are ongoing could help us improve in even more the, the following. Uh, and also you can show that you can double the speed of convergence if you look at the eigenvalues. So first here you note that we have an, an error estimates if you compare the whole gradient in L2, but then we are not interested in, con it's not uh, that quantity which interests us, but we need to control the terms that appear in the Hessian matrix. And those terms have a particular structure they are products using the bilinear form uh, associated to the, the material derivatives. Um, and therefore, if you compute differences of such uh, terms, you can show that the, the worst uh, term appearing is in fact the product of two terms similar to what we had before, which would double the speed of convergence. And this is a well-known uh, when uh, searching for uh, what is called goal-oriented estimators in the literature. And now uh, I arrived at uh, uh, the, the numerical results that we were able to obtain using uh, these uh, a priori estimates. So uh, first, uh, let me talk about the local minimality of the regular polygon. Of the, uh, and uh, we managed to show that uh, for n up to eight, the regular polygon uh, is a local minimum to machine errors in our numerical computations. So what we did, we, we computed uh, everything on, uh, on a mesh of size 10 to the minus four, which for the Pentagon lead, led to approximately 250 million uh, degrees of freedom. The simulations were done in FIFM uh, using a, class, a, a, a cluster at uh, Ecole Polytechnique. And then after having the numerical simulations from the finite elements, we took those into MATLAB where we used uh, the IntLab uh, interval arithmetics library, and we used the a priori estimates to to construct intervals around each quantity uh, corresponding to the estimates that we have uh, in theory. So we replaced everything with intervals, and we performed the computations. And for example, for the Pentagon, four of the eigenvalues were zero. So for the remaining eigenvalues, we have. Uh, three eigenvalues, each with multiplicity two. For each one of these eigenvalues, we have uh, lower bounds are strictly positive, lower bounds given by the a priori estimate uh, described previously, um, which are strictly positive. So in this case, the Pentagon would be an, a local minimum up to machine errors. Um, in order to have a complete numerical proof, one would need to do the whole computation with interval arithmetics. Um, but generally it's admitted that uh, the machine errors are of size uh, epsilon machine error, which is 10 to the minus 16, multiplied by h to the power minus two. So for, uh, for the values of h that we use, we, we don't expect the machine errors to be, uh, to, be uh, to dominate the computations, but nevertheless, one, if, you, if you do not control this, uh, cannot say that, that uh, you have a proof. So this will be a, a future work that we, we uh, would like to do. And also uh, we computed the eigenvalues up to 30 for a smaller mesh size. And uh, the non-certified computations give the same indication that, uh, well, the regular polygon is a, a local minimum. And then uh, uh, just detailing a bit more uh, the computations up to the octagon, uh, you can uh, you can uh, see for h equal to 10 to the minus four, the computations were precise enough in the sense that the intervals obtained for the eigenvalues of the Hessian do not contain zero for two n minus four of them. But then you can try to see what is the optimal h, the, gr the, greatest, the greatest mesh size for which you can still uh, have uh, the certification given by, by the a priori estimate results. And you can see that, for example, for the Pentagon, the smallest uh, 
the largest mesh corresponds to approximately 2.5 million. So it's still too large to use directly uh, in club or uh, an interval arithmetic uh, software to validate directly the, the finite element problem. But we hope that uh, improving the error estimates, we could manage to, we will manage to decrease even further this, uh, this uh, problem size and have uh, a fully certified uh, result. Now, uh, just a few words concerning on the, uh, the reduction to a finite number of computations. First, uh, we provide a, an analytic upper bound on diameter. If you consider an optimal polygon, you can show that if you consider a, a polygon with fixed area, pi, let's say, then you can show that if you have a, a diameter which is larger than a certain uh, threshold, then that polygon cannot be optimal. And the results uh, used to prove uh, this theorem were inspired by a paper by Dorin Bukur and uh, Dario Mazzoleni, where they used the torsion function. And the key idea is that if you are able to remove the intersection of P with uh, a, a strip where the torsion function is small enough, then uh, this would decrease the first eigenvalue. Problem in our case is that if you do this in a careless way, you might uh, increase the number of sides. So we need to, to take care of, of this fact. And the sketch of the proof would go as follow. You would choose a, a large enough number of strips that you have one which has a, a small torsion function. You would like to, to remove this. For example, you can consider even more strips to try to not remove uh, a vertex of the polygon. When you remove this strip, uh, which is a union of trapezes, you will have two polygons with a total of two n plus four sides. Either one of the two polygons has at most uh, uh, at, at least four sides, then we are good because uh, both polygons after splitting are admissible. So at least one of them will be better. But the problematic case is uh, if you remove any trapeze uh, and that gives you a triangle and the polygon with n plus one sides, you are not, you cannot apply uh, the, the, the algorithm. However, uh, you can show if all, uh, let's say you want to remove uh, one strip and uh, all the trapezes uh, removed generate a triangle on one side of then you can show first that all triangles are one on one side by using a continuity argument and uh, then if you if you know that all triangles are on one side you can pick a triangle which cons corresponds to the diameter and you can show that you can still move you can still remove this trapeze when uh, you move it till you meet a word and uh, this is done by by looking at the torsion function and the estimates related torsion function, which uh, depend on the distance to the boundary. And uh, if you are able to remove a trapeze, uh, which, which comes into contact with uh, another vertex, then you obtain two polygons, which are admissible. So you are sure that uh, you contradict optimality. Anyways, the, the details, if you are interested, are, are in the paper. For, for an optimal polygon, we, also, we can also prove uh, that there is a lower bound for the minimal edge length when you fix the area. You can show that there is a, a lower bound for the in radius. And also you can show that you have a, a stability result if the distance between the polygons is small, the distance between the eigenvalues are, is smaller than a well-defined quantity. And then for the reduction to a finite number of computations, the strategy is very similar to what I presented in the for, for a real function. If the conjecture is true, and we will see why do we need this hypothesis, then its proof can be reduced to a finite number of numerical computations. So the first step would be to compute the eigenvalue and the eigenfunction for a regular polygon in a certified way. Then uh, use, uh, co compute the eigenvalues of the Hessian and certify local minimality. And then with the stability result, you obtain a a neighborhood of the regular polygon where uh, you don't have any other local any other minimizer Just, uh, using the bound on the diameter you can reverse this and uh, have a bound of uh, on uh, on the area uh, if you work with the scale invariant functional and you fix the longest edge to be your uh, between two two fit point or that you can choose okay and then the final step the following so suppose that uh, outside the local minimality neighborhood, you know that uh, your objective function is bigger than the one for the regular polygon plus some epsilon. 
then you would pick delta small enough uh, following the, the previous estimates such that if the distance between two polygons is smaller than delta, then the distance between the objective function is smaller than some quantity depending on, on epsilon one. You will cover the compact region where, where uh, anime signal polygons lie with a finite number of, of ball of radius delta. And for each one of these ball, you can show that if you, if you make one certified numerical computations and uh, this computation give you something better than the value on the regular polygon, then no other polygon, no other competitor exists in this ball. So uh, if this strategy succeeds, you, uh, in a finite number of computations, you exclude all polygons outside the local minimality neighborhood. The problem is that in practice, you don't know this epsilon one. So you will start with a guess, let's say epsilon equal to one. And if the procedure does not succeed, you will divide by two and restart. Uh, however, how do you know you're finishing an unfinite number of steps? Well, if the conjecture is true, you will end in a finite number of steps because other, otherwise you will find a counterexample. So if for any epsilon, you will find some polygon that violates this uh, inequality that is close enough to the regular polygon and it's outside the local minimality neighborhood, then you find a sequence converging to a counterexample which does not exist by hypothesis. But anyways, we suppose the conjecture is true uh, following uh, all the indications that we have for numericals, numerics and te theory. So if one could uh, implement such an algorithm, it will probably lead to, to a proof of the conjecture in a finite number of computations. So to conclude, uh, so we have a, a, a preprint available where everything uh, that I presented here is detailed. As I said, a missing ingredient to, to establish local minimality is to calling uh, floating point errors in large time problems that we hope we will be able to imp further improve this and have a complete proof of local minimality. Uh, then concerning the last part, where you would like to reduce the problem to a funny number of computations, if you would have convexity, this would drastically simplify things. So. Uh, we would like also to prove that the optimal polygon is convex. And well, uh, the goal would be to perform, uh, to apply the strategy at least for n equals five in order to, uh, to have a proof of yet another case where the polygonal fabric can inequality holds. That's all I had to say. I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot uh, for, for this talk. Um, it is now time for uh, questions. We'll start. There was a question a few minutes ago by uh, Lotfi Hermi in, in the chat asking if there's a version of the, the Saint Venant Polya isoperimetric inequality for poly polygonal domains. Uh, Dorin answered that to his knowledge it's open, but do you have uh, more to say about that? Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's an open question. In a, in a way, it is uh, a bit simpler than uh, inequality. And you could apply the same strategy to this problem if you want. Some of the aspects would be maybe, but we did not uh, go into details regarding this. There are other questions? May I? Yes, yes. Just a brief question. What would be a strategy to prove a uh, global sort of estimate, if any, even if computational? The question is uh, to, mm -hmm. prove the, to prove the global minimality? Yeah. Well, even if you're trying to do it computationally, so what would be the, how would one modify the strategy probably? Yeah, well, um, well, this strategy is, uh, is for the global case, but uh, of course, in the, in the way it's presented here is most, mostly in an abstract uh, mm -hmm. setting, uh, because, uh, well, this, uh, this uh, step here with a covering of balls is, you can imagine it's not at all uh, optimal. You could imagine of trying to exploit uh, even more the, the, the fact that uh, the eigenvalues are decreasing with respect to set inclusion mm -hmm. and maybe, uh, maybe use, uh, use uh, this type of, uh, of arguments to, to have an even more efficient way of, of uh, reducing the problem to, to a finite number of computations. Of course, what would be ideal is to, to prove the convexity 
Mm -hmm. once, once you have convexity, then uh, well, you can you can easily imagine more simplified stuff. Do you exclude something like very small angles or? Uh, yes, I I think in the same way that you can exclude uh, can exclude small edges. I guess you can exclude also small angles. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Interesting. Yeah. A question in um, chat from uh, Kristen uh, Luca asking: Do you know the exponent of the epsilon in the stability result explicitly? Uh, no. If you talk about the result about the the stability of the Hessian matrix, no, that, that's uh, not explicit yet. So it would depend on uh, all the ingredients used in the in the proof, uh, notably on the the Stein extension, which is maybe not. The most optimal way you could do it, but uh, for the for the moment we don't have an explicit. Uh, do, do you have do you have bounds for it? Uh, not even that. We we didn't since uh, we saw that the, it it got really complicated, to, and uh, we saw that it's uh, we would not be able to finish what we the strategy. Uh, then we did not go all the way to the, the exponent, but mm -hmm. I, I guess it's doable. Do we have a? Other questions for uh, Benjamin? Right. Well, uh, if not, let's uh, thank him again. Thanks a lot for the talk today. And uh, we will uh, reconvene uh, next week, uh, same time as usual, with a talk by uh, Yves Colin Verzia, who will talk to us about uh, attractors for internal or inertial waves. So see you all uh, next week. And thanks again for being here.